days a day. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Yo Geez podcast. Today we've got a very interesting guest that I'm delighted to have on, someone called Christian uh, Foley, who is with us now. Uh, Christian is a, well, I think you said it earlier well, he's someone who works with words, whether that be poetry, music, working with kids, working in prisons. He does a lot. He's a very busy person. Um, but I think, Christian, first of all, welcome. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. How are you doing today? I'm good. I mean... I'm pretty tired. I've I've just been working in a school in my year six class. They're so, they're so badly behaved. It's just <laughs> like I feel like I've done like four tours of Vietnam in two hours. Okay, it was it was it, it was stressful. But maybe more poetry uh, than Vietnam had, I think, and and less heroin, uh, ideally. <laughs> uh, but yeah, pretty pretty shattered. But you know, got a nice comfortable armchair. Yeah, hopefully so, this is like the relaxing end to the yeah, day yeah, that you just needed. Chill. It's like a little therapy session. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we won't get to like <laughs> psychoanalyzing you. Um, but do you want to tell our listeners, our viewers, a little bit about yourself? Sure. So if I found my lanyard somewhere, it would say that I am a poet in residence, right? So my job is to work with institutions, whether that be schools, hospitals, you know, you name it, um, embedded in, in that institution to help people express themselves. So my main area is education. And my main area within education is what we call alternative education. So that means the sector that you don't often hear about, very overlooked, very under-resourced uh, and underfunded. And that is uh, the pupil referral unit arena. So when someone's excluded from school, they'll be sent to a place, you know, and there, there would have been people at your school who got kicked out. And you mm. might not have known where, where they went. Because it was the same with mm. me. When someone got kicked out of school, it's like, where do they go? They just they go. Just they want to vanish from their life. Melting yeah. into glue. You know, you, you never know what happens to these forgotten children. Um, and what happens is that they go to uh, a referral unit. Um, and that is where I specialize in, in helping these children who are amazing. These young people, the, the characters I've met over a decade uh, in this area, uh, they've gone on to become wonderful authors, poets, mm. activists, actors, when the society and the world tells them that there will be a statistic or, you know, mm. and it's not that not everyone is successful i'm not saying that we are changing everybody's life for the better but we're doing what we can with what we have and it's something that society actually needs to know about because you don't know about this world mm. um so that's where i'm primarily based so i have a music studio we turned it into a record label the school so the kids put out hip-hop albums i produce they rap mm. or you know we do collabs and stuff it's, it's honestly one of the funnest jobs in the world and then amongst that i also work with mainstream schools primary secondary i visit a lot of schools around the country i work for goldsmiths university um in their education department kind of with teacher training and stuff like that i do a phd which is the bane of my life like <laughs> i've done like forty thousand words and they're like well done that's a good introduction I'm like, all right cheers um so yeah busy busy yeah. man but like i said to you before off air it's all the same job right mm. it's all working with words in just different capacities uh, so it's under the umbrella, I do words wherever the camera is. That's what I do, words. Yeah, yeah, love that. And I think it says on your website that 50 Cent says you've got some flow. Yeah. Right? What, what an endorsement. What a what weird, an endorsement. What a weird I endorsement. I love that, though. I uh, love it when you see that. I just woke up one day and, like, there was loads of messages. This was on Facebook Messenger. It was, it was a thing. And there was, like, loads of messages on Facebook being like, I can't believe this. How has this happened? I'm like, how, how has what happened? <laughs> what have I done? I've just been asleep. Like, I haven't done anything. <laughs> really worried, you know. Like, oh, dear. Um, and then it just transpired that 50 Cent had gone on a, he must have gone on a YouTube rabbit hole. Uh, mm. quite the rabbit hole I love it that someone like 50 Cent goes on the rabbit hole as well yeah YouTube. yeah I, everyone you, no one's immune from I it I think he might have been indulging in maybe some extracurricular activities and just was <laughs> uh, in that kind of zoned out space where he was quite willing to be led down a YouTube rabbit hole and was just kind of like <laughs> I'll click on this I'll click on this and somehow he got to the East London poetry education scene wow. uh, which is where he remained for the next few hours tweeting about it and talking about it that's like, incredible who's this guy this guy's got flow you know was quite the endorsement. It changed my life. Honestly, mm. it changed my life because it brought my work to a level of visibility that it hadn't, you know, experienced. So, so that's mm. how I kind of broke into having television appearances and working with the media. Um, I'm really kind of hijacking their agenda, which was to, you know, let's showcase this real fun poet doing a freestyle, but then using that publicity to direct it towards the young people that I work with mm. and the kind of plights that we are facing, you know, in East London. So that's how I kind of used that publicity and started working a lot more with uh, serious youth violence and becoming an ambassador with mental health. So taking the fun stuff and kind of just jamming in the issues that needed to be talked about. Uh, 
and then for a while they just you know referred to me as this kind of um knife crime expert what well, well, no i'm not <laughs> <laughs> All right, but then I was only getting media appearances un- under that. Yeah, guys. you just get the label and then it sticks with you. Yeah, so the, every few years I'll go viral for something different. I don't know what it'll be next. Yeah, so most recently it was like rapping nursery rhymes, um, and then it, like all the the grime stars like Wiley and everyone discovered it. Um, yes. And then yeah, again, it, again, it, there's a whole spike in public interest. Yeah, and then I got like a BBC documentary from it. Um, and that then brings its own spike in interest. Mm. So it, it works in waves. But it's all about using that publicity to guide your own kind of like, what do you care about? How can yeah. you get it across to people? Like, you know, what matters? Is yeah, me just yeah. doing a, a I love fun that. freestyle is not enough, right? Yeah. There's, there's stuff. You so how can that get help from. create the change that we want to see or yeah. the change that you want to see? Yeah, exactly. Love that. And we'll delve more into um, to words, how you started like getting into words and all that stuff. Mm. But I think first we normally start this pod with another question, which is, what's your problem, mate? Well, I'd say that um, I'm just one of them boys. Here for a minute, then gone again, boys. Exes say they don't bother with boys. If the boys like me, no one's one of them boys. My mom said, have honour, my boy. Life is a path and you run it, my boy. And if you fall off, make a song of it, boy. But I fell short like Domino's boy. All us boys just want to be men. See good guys and we want to be them. See these guys and we want to be prem. And we make these Gs and we want to see Ms. All us boys just want to be known. I got grown now, I want to be home. 14 years old saying, dad, don't go. Because if you go, then how will I grow? But all us boys... Boys just want to be loved. Boy, don't cry. They put it on us. Boy, you're a boy. Boy, better be tough. So swing for the jaw. Roll, roll with a punch. But all us boys just want to be loved. Boy, you're a boy. They put it on us. Like, boy, don't cry. Yeah, better be tough. Swing for the jaw or roll with a punch. That's a bit of a problem. Um, uh, You know, (laughs) I'm almost speechless. Um, That is an amazing problem. Thank you. And I almost kind of like want to have a little bit of silence after that. Kind of like let that sit because that was fucking beautiful so thank you thank you and um that problem there you're talking about i think you're saying that all all us boys want to be loved that was kind of like a line that like really stuck out to me and i think it's something that i think as men it's i mean as humans i think that's what all of us want you know that's when we're born that's kind of we get that from our parents and i think throughout life it's kind of we all need humans we all need that love and and so often as men, we shut that love down or we kind of like put up these barriers because love is feminine or love is soft. And and actually, it's almost sometimes even saying the word love is hard for lots of men. And, and I've gone through moments in my life where I've definitely felt closed to being love and showing love and giving love. I think it's something that is yeah in our society becomes hard by what mm. essentially by the way we were brought up i think as men a lot of the time well i think we we probably you know we love our friends but we would never communicate that in in that term you would never use the word love right yeah but, you know the, these strong bonds that you form between men you know in your social circles that that last lifetimes mm. yeah, but you would never think to express that using that word even mm. though that's definitely what it is, yeah, you know, but it's always given with these caveats, you know, with these kind of homophobic undertones of, you know, like no homo or pause or you yeah, know, yeah, this, this, this fear of fragility uh, that kind of underpins most of the ways that we communicate, yeah, is at the heart of everything. So, yeah, yeah, even I can even the idea of looking like a best mate in the eye and be like, I love you, mate. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, okay. even I'm laughing. Uh, I actually like, I couldn't, couldn't imagine. Do that. I'll sometimes buy WhatsApp be something like, no, oh, yeah, I love you, man, but. But net the idea of yeah, looking yeah, at me, yeah. you know I mean? I like, might not look at me in the eye. It might be kind of like a, a shoulder squeeze. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. You know I love you. Yeah, you know I love you, mate. You. Yeah. Like, Maybe a hug. I could do a hug and be like, I love you, mate. Yeah, I wouldn't do it like candlelit dinner. Like, yeah. you know, what are you doing Saturday? <laughs> I've, you know, I've booked a place. I've got yeah, something to really, tell you. Yeah, you know? really, really intense. <laughs> love you. Why do you think as men we find it hard to say, uh, you know, let's ignore the candlelit dinner stuff, but why do you think even just saying, yeah, I love you, mate. Like, why do you think we find that hard? Well, because from very young, we're conditioned that, uh, you know, strength is is physical, not mental, and that everything has to be seen through that lens. When we're talking about problems, the, the boys poem I did there is part of like a wider series of poems that are mm. called The Problem with Hercules. And that was like a series that I developed working with violent offenders who were in prison for quite a long time. And it, it really made me think about these, you know, very physical guys, six foot guys, tattooed, muscular, um, who 
recontextualize what it meant to be strong because we had this workshop one time and I, I took some young offenders to meet um, uh, an inmate who was running a group. And it was designed for, for prisoners to show young offenders the realities of what it was like inside. It's all well and good, you know, me being like, don't go to prison, lads. Because yeah. they were like, well, what do you know about it? You're yeah, never yeah, even yeah. at risk of going to prison, you know. I'm not going to listen to you because you're just coming in, you know, once a week. You don't live in our reality. But... If someone, let's, let's call him Jay, if someone like Jay, who's in prison for a number of years, 25 or so, gives them the advice of the reality of prison, it's mm. different. Mm. So, so we, we took these boys in, eight boys, and we sat in a circle. And Jay runs the, the session. And he said, right, this is what I've done. I, I've, I've killed one person with a shotgun. Uh, I've done this armed robbery. I've done this armed robbery. I've, I've harmed numerous others. No one on the street would ever mess with my reputation I'm a big guy am I a strong guy and he's going around individually to the young people and he, he's pretty terrifying when he wants to be Jay it's a bit of an act mm. you know because I, I uh, knew him um, every boy is looking at him saying yep yeah, you're strong you're strong you're strong you're strong you're, you're, you're really strong and he looks at them all individually and says you're all wrong I'm the weakest man here and he says do you know what strength is strength would be being able to raise my daughter Strength would be being able to kiss my wife every night, tell her that I love her, to be present. Strength would be when someone is in my face not pulling a trigger. Strength would be when someone's asking me to carry out a robbery for money, saying, no, there are more important things. If I was able to do that, I would be a strong man. And you can see the boys realizing in real time that strength isn't what they thought it was, you know? And that's what I call the problem with Hercules is that we literally deify Hercules as a demigod, right? He's the strongest. He is the envy of everyone. Everyone wants Herculean strength, okay? But in the myth of Hercules, you know, Hercules goes mad and kills his entire family. Not a great look. Um, and, it, you know, this, this was an act even emulated by someone we called the Pegasus Kid, the wrestler Chris Benoit. He did the same thing. He killed his entire family and then himself with a barbell to the neck. And if there is not I a more potent that. metaphor for how that. strength can be dangerous, you know, he died by the hand of his, you know, own muscles and own gym. And I, I see that as a symbol of if we purely focus on strength as a physical phenomenon, as some, you know, I'm always going to be the strongest. I'm always going to be the most muscled while neglecting that strength also exists in a mental capacity. Mm. then that that road can be very dangerous i'm not saying it's not good to keep fit and go to the gym mm. i'm not saying that but i'm saying that there is a whole other arena of fitness that we neglect as men and that is you know the mental capacity so being able to articulate how you feel being able to be vulnerable being able to be weak um and that's what my problem was too uh, you know i grew up very well educated in an academic sense very poorly educated in an emotional sense you know i was mm. from a laddie football rugby environment okay i went to the gym i was good at football i was good at rugby and that that was what mattered that's how i conceived strength yeah and we had this uh it was like a fairground i grew up in the channel islands right you know the gritty streets of a, <laughs> a nine nine mile island in the channel and um we had this fair and it would come around once a year and I, I really wanted to impress girls as you do when you're, you know, 14. Mm. And I was too scared to go on the, the rides. So I was like, how do I demonstrate that I have, you know, this, this, this courage that is, is obviously how you impress girls uh, through bravery and, and strength. Um, so they had this electronic punch bag. I don't know if you've ever seen one. There, oh, yeah. The, like, the one with the scores. With, with the arm. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And so I was like, right, that's how we do it. And <laughs> I wasn't the only boy thinking this. Every boy was thinking this. So we'd, li we'd line up in this kind of like Roman Senate style amphitheater facing this, uh, this electronic punch bag, everyone watching. And you'd go and you'd punch it as hard as you could. And I used to do that. And then it would kind of give this like mournful polyphonic tone like, Durr. and I was like, oh, that's not a good thing. And then my score would come up. Someone else would punch in and go, Durr. and they'd get the higher score. And actually that was how we categorized ourselves as men literally that score that we received so the higher your score on that electronic punch bag the harder you were the stronger you were the more popular you were the more of a man you were so that's what it meant yeah. to be a man getting the highest score possible on how hard you could punch uh, and that's our problem essentially because we just mm. saw strength as right uh, this is how hard i can punch yeah uh, and, and that can lead to all sorts of problems down the line and and it certainly did for me because i was woefully unprepared when life actually hit me because uh, you know 
I was just something I, I was never trained in. Yeah. And in fact, if anything, what we can see is very similar, like childhood to you in terms of, you know, sports, laddie culture, football. I mean, I'm still wearing a football t-shirt today, so I don't have too much <laughs> has changed in that sense. But, you know, I, I completely resonate with that. And I think the weakness was showing emotion. Mm. It was showing that you might be a bit scared of something. It was showing that actually you might be a bit, you know, anxious, whatever it is. But even just showing any fragility, that was considered weakness. And was, you know, that whole thing of like, boys don't cry. Like that was a thing. Mm. Like that was a thing. That wasn't, that wasn't a song or that, that was literally like a state of mind that most men have when they're younger. It's like, I can't cry. I'm a boy. And it, you know, that thing about actually what, makes us strong in terms of being vulnerable i think is really important and, and another thing you touched on as well in that poem is this thing about a boy and man and like that transition that we make and it's it's almost it's almost like to make that transition that rite of passage at least back in the day it was about shutting off emotion you become a man when you can deal with everything mm. do you know what i mean and then mm. you can like nothing affects you now i'm a man i can deal with it yeah whatever life throws at me this i can process deal with of it numbing to the point yeah that it's like i can no longer feel therefore i'm a man where i yeah. it's the opposite you have to dehumanize yourself in order mm. to categorize yourself as a human yeah i'd never thought about it like that <laughs> as, as in like literally that that journey when you arrive at least what it was and what it was for me is like it's when I show no emotion. It's when I, it's when I can handle everything. Yeah, I mean, when in fact the, I'm not handling that's, that's everything. That's the phrase, isn't it? Man up, be yeah. a man. I remember when I was playing football in a very heated inter-island match between Jersey and Guernsey. Um, you know, the, derby. The, 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 derby. Old, the old firm. You yeah. know, and the, <laughs> you laugh, but uh, I, I was the ultras were there. <laughs> Get this, I was 15 years old and I, I, I was a goalkeeper. I, I mean, still am a goalkeeper. And um, some fan leapt over the side of like the sideboards where they were advertising like the local milk or whatever the, the single mm. advert was in <laughs> Guernsey. <The> milk, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, get your Guernsey milk. He leaps over this. I look around to see what he's doing. Just punches me in the face. Just like <laughs> floors me and then leaps back over. Grown man. Yeah, I was a teenager. You're 15. Yeah, 15. Grown man. I, I got over and I was like, my face hurt so much. I was also so embarrassed. And I go over to my coach, who is this kind of Scottish, very hard man called Dave. And I said, this man has just punched me in the face. He's like, you go man up, son. Man up. Don't cry to me. I'll get back on the pitch. And I was just like, all right, and Dave. That, that, that yeah. was it. He was meant... As, as somebody who works with children now, he, I was in his care, you know, like, uh, was, mm. you can't just let me get punched and then tell me, uh, you know, I'm, I think that he was like, don't be a baby. Like, I was like, yeah, the, the last thing that you need is, is someone to say yeah. that in that situation. But that, that, you know, it was, that was a typical, response. that was what it was yeah. like. Like, that's what Dave would say. <laughs> that's what Dave was the, the every man here. Yeah. You know? yeah like, yeah, he was, yeah. he's the every man. Yeah. I think most people would, was Dave's response. Was his name actually Dave or was that the. I've tried to change it for purposes of anonymity, but I, I think I've accidentally just. He was called Dave. I okay, think. okay. He is called Dave. Fairly common name, so hopefully he won't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a bit going back to kind of what you're about and words, and obviously, you know, the way you shared your problem, never, de- never, de- never been done before and, and love it is. When did you start to get into words in a way where, I guess, when did they, so I guess all of us use words, right? But when did you start to use it as a tool for something, whether that be a tool to express your creativity or how you were feeling? When did, when did that interest kind of like really spark? Well, I mean, my affinity for words was, was early, a a preliterate phase. I think for a lot, like, this is a stereotype, but a lot of boys get interested in dinosaurs. If you're interested in dinosaurs and you're learning these names, what you're essentially doing, you're learning a, a foreign language. You know, you're learning Latin very young. If you're able to recite Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus, Diplodocus, <laughs> Brontosaurus, Brachiosaurus, you know. All the classic. Yeah, you know, the, the, you know, the Avengers, the main ones. Uh, you're, you're, you're working with very complicated words. Now, if you were to meet those words in a reading book, the reading book would say you need to be at least kind of eight, nine years old to access that language. But if you're accessing that language before you're even reading so i would you know i would learn th- these names and, and you know make my parents listen to me reel them off in a way these are my first kind of spoken word performances mm-hmm. uh and then as i discover writing uh i i wanted to tell stories i was a huge liar and probably still am and being a good liar 
meant that I was able to be very imaginative in, in fiction with the stories that I was telling. So I was kind of un I saw fiction as a way to be unbridled and unconstrained. So uh, as a kid, I was writing these mad poems and these mad stories. And I think I started winning competitions with it when I was about 10. But the the poem I won a competition with wasn't this mad fictional lie. It was, you know, this, this story about love, like real love that I have for my own mother. I mean, it's not... A, you know, not the coolest or sexiest yeah. poem to enter the canon with. Um, but it was just like, uh, it was just a poem about how I love my mum and mm. something about the expression of it, I don't know, it was popular. And I read it out and I remember the feeling of, um, I like this. I like performing something that I've written, sharing it with the world. Then it wasn't until I was a teenager and kind of discovered hip hop that I more seriously got into conveying my words. Mm. I think when my parents divorced, I was looking for you know, like most angsty teenagers, I'm just glad I didn't kind of end up in a metal band, you know, and watching Kerrang. Nothing against those people. I'm just now, I'm glad that I didn't go down that yeah. route. It just happened to be, I was in HMV and lo and behold, old 50 Cent, I, he was there with his, uh, he had this album, Get Rich or Die oh, Trying. Yeah. And it, you know, there was bullet holes all yeah, over him. And yeah. I looked at that. I, I know was, the exact yeah, album yeah, yeah. cover. I can picture and I looked, that. I looked at that and I was like, oh, maybe I'll pick up that. I'm kind of glad I didn't. And then I bought Late Registration by Kanye West, who before mm. he kind of, you know, is not so, not so great anymore. Um, <laughs> he was, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I picked up and I, I played that album and I, I put it in. And it had all of, you know, this socially conscious lyrics about like civil rights history and so much that I learned from it. And I was able to remember what he'd said after the, the CD was off, you know, it was back in CD days. So I was able to, to remember the language. And I was like, what's the point of me reciting someone else's rhymes when I could write my own and mm -hmm. then remember them? So I just used to then download instrumentals off LimeWire, like completely mess up my computer and, yeah. you know, all the viruses, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Or everything that came with it. Um, and, and then I started writing about, you know, my own life and, you know, very localized experiences of you know my dad had an affair and he he left home and it was all very sudden thing it was like i woke up literally in the middle of one night to chaos like he, mm. he'd had an affair with he, my dad won't listen um so it's fine um but he'd had an affair with his best friend's wife right oh. and that's not a good thing yeah. to to wake up to uh, you know smooth, how old were you saying yeah. and i was 14 14 but, you know, being a, a young man and this kind of figure that you idolize is, is, is quite heroic and infallible. Mm. Now that I'm a man, I understand. You know, I understand that we are not the, the heroes that our children make us out to be. Mm. You know, we're, we're, we're real and we're capable of mistakes. But it was, it was a huge hit, you know, yeah. and it, you know, for my mother as well. And we had to move house and it was a lot of upheaval all of a sudden. The only silver lining was I can be a rapper now. I've got the struggle story. You need the yeah, struggle yeah. story. So I'm there just, you know, fuck my dad. Like, da -da -da, yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> just yeah. like a uh, young Eminem. Just, oh. um, but, you know, it, it was a real vessel for me to communicate how I felt. Um, and particularly to my own friends, because I, I, was, I was very ad adept at wearing this mask. Like at school, mm. it didn't affect my performance. I was still academic. I was still sporting. And I carried on every day as normal. To the point that no one knew for like three years about what had no happened. No one knew for three years. And it was like... Eve I'm kind of skimming over a lot of things, but within that, you know, both my parents were suicidal, vocally so, you know. Mm. So I was caught up in this kind of suicidal serve and return in this tennis match of I'm going to do it, no, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I'm just the net here watching all of these kind of words fly fly past, but they got caught. Um, and I'm like, you know, I carry this with me. So all of this was going on, but I was still there at school, you know, wearing this mask. And I think that even in my life now, I, I still have that exact same mask and it was kind of a, a coping mechanism and a defense mechanism. But I think because I was able to articulate it through my words and I had this first CD that I put out when I was 16. I remember it's called Soulful Stuff, terrible title. Um, uh, and I went down the local youth club and a man called Ivor really helped me out and he printed my CDs and then my mum helped me like, you know, it's real hip hop stuff here, like cutting out yeah. and making the titles and doing the track list and then, you know, like... Uh, and and I and I tell I told the whole story right. It was a very autobiographical CD, you know that uh, it felt like a memoir, even though I was only like seventeen. I hadn't lived much of a life, but I'm told that mm. I really w want to revisit that CD now. And, yeah, and, I want to hear it now. Yeah, as well. like, the, I feel like it was, I need to hear it. I think there's still bits and pieces on YouTube, but that also kind of set the blueprint for me on how to make a hip hop album. Every album I've ever done since has told a mm. particular portion of my life. 
uh, and they've always been very autobiographical. I've never really made music about stuff that doesn't directly affect me. Mm. You know, I, unless I have a personal connection to it, I don't kind of delve into that. So it was at the time a huge like focus for me. Mm. Uh, and it, you know, it became my life. I, I wasn't expecting to, however many years on, be sitting here as someone who works professionally in, in that arena. I just thought it'd be something that I would always do kind of like behind the scenes. And it was something that, you know, people probably took the piss a bit because, I mean, they definitely did. Because it's funny, right? Like, there's just this white boy in hip hop, just like, who is magically able to rap. No one knows why, including the rapper himself. And, you know, I went to like the equivalent of grammar school where we, mm. you know, we used to wear these blazers, like emblazoned with yellow, we used to look like kind of bumblebees, uh, <laughs> you know, like bumblebees wearing Lynx yeah. Africa and shit. Like shame. that's your 50 cent version of the, the album coming <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the like, uniform. Look, I've undone like, my tie. Yeah, um, yeah, like paint stain on the shirt. <laughs> um, it's not and, even and so, yeah. And you were saying that you didn't tell anyone for three years, but. W- why did you feel comfortable rapping about it? Like, what is it? Because like, cause, cause to me, for example, and I think probably to most people, the idea of like rapping about it and performing it to people is almost more intimidating than just having a chat with a mate. So what was it about? Because you're creating this art from a big moment in your life, right? Mm. And then you are getting CDs printed. People are going to listen to it. So you are sharing like your heart and your your soul and like what's been going on with you and all your emotions so what is it that made that easier than just because you said no one knew for three years and just Mm. chatting with a mate and just being like this happened this how i'm feeling like why the music and why why that expression well i've always actually felt the opposite i've always felt it was easier for me to do it in that medium i've uh, almost more natural than it is mm. talking uh, and it's been the same ever since you know when huge events have happened in my life i've dealt with it and communicated through through hip hop i don't know why I, that i found it easier maybe it's just because it's what i've always done so yeah that that's how i did it i would rather have someone listen to it at a remove mm. than me sit down and do it uh and that is still my method of communication. Probably that's not that very healthy, is it? If, you know, if you're in a relationship and, you know, there's something... Got to release to, a CD yeah, to yeah, chat yeah, to the like, girlfriend about it. Um, yeah, yeah uh, can you actually just check Spotify? Um, and so you can <laughs> see what I think really about you. Want you to say yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I've got an urgent it, message, it, right? It, Download it now. Yeah, yeah. Live on all digital platforms. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, so, so obviously there has to be... You know, something has to give. But I've always, yeah, I've always felt more comfortable... With, within that like like starting this podcast it was way more comfortable for me to begin with a poem mm. than to launch into a way of describing what i do i like to just show it rather than tell it mm. in, in many cases why do you think that is just what is what you're more comfortable with in the same way that i'm more comfortable talking about it and couldn't imagine you know writing a poem or rapping about how i'm feeling is it is it it's generally you just feel more comfortable doing that well, look, this is what we said about the mask, right? It's mm. like a concealer on your soul, a mask, isn't it? It's a way of uh, protecting and disguising how you feel. If I can do something through a poem, it, there's one layer of remove between me and complete honesty. Like I said, mm. being a little kid telling lies in, in, in poems, the way I tell the truth now is, is through that remove. You know, I only tell the truth in, in rap verses, I reckon. Yeah, Everything else I dress up in... in however you know however i want it but i'm only the most honest when i'm rhyming i i think and i will always make reference to that in songs of like you want to hear me tell the truth then listen to this yeah kind of thing yeah as you actually made me think of something is with my girlfriend a lot of the time when I, she's always like why do you have to say something in a weird accent or a weird voice when you're complimenting me I don't know. And I'll sometimes, if, yeah, if yeah. I'm like, oh, it's you look really good like that. I, for some weird reason, I'll say it in, I don't know, like a, a Scottish accent or something <laughs> like that. And she'll be like, why are you using an accent <laughs> to say that? And I think maybe it is that. It's kind of like, it is almost like a mask. You're pretending to, well, at least for me, maybe like you're pretending to be, not pretending to be someone else, but kind of, you're not this version of you because yeah. like you sound a little bit different or you're expressing it's yourself a in a different way. isn't it? Because I think... Mm. Well, when we're vulnerable, it's uh, it's dangerous, isn't it? You want to protect yourself. And this goes, you know, 
psychologists would call it, uh, they would say it links back to attachment theory. And this is where they train mm -hmm. us at school. Whether this theory holds weight, who knows. But the idea is that when you're, you know, developing and you're starting to crawl around and explore and interact with the world, that's when you, your, your brain grows. And the more you explore, the more your brain grows because the more experiences you feed it. But you can only explore if you've got, you know, a rooted attachment figure who is secure. So if mm. your mum is in the room, you're going to feel comfortable exploring all of these corners of the room. First time you explore, you go back to her. Next time you'll explore a little bit further. Now, if you explore, you come back and your mother's not there. You, th you associate exploration with abandonment. So you think, mm. I'm not going to explore again because last time I did it, my mother wasn't there. No secure attachment. So what happens then is that the child will not explore, mm. will, will stay rooted out of fear mm. for, you know, for, that, for that loss. And if you're not exploring, neurologically, you're not developing. And your whole world shrinks. And as you go into teenage years, your outlook kind of matches that. You're fiercely protective over what you have. You're terrified of abandonment. You're not seeking out new experiences and you're on the defensive. That's what attachment theory would say. So when we're talking about vulnerability, mm. when we're being vulnerable, we're exploring beyond the realms of safety. And what if you try it once and it doesn't work out? You, you, you're vulnerable to a mate, you know? You have a breakup, you come out, and your mate just says, oh, you'll be fine. Mm. Well, I'm not going to tell my mate about how I feel then because I've been vulnerable and it's not worked out. So next time it happens, I'm going to stay rooted in the, in the spot that I was mm. in. I'm not going to explore this, this, this realm of emotion. So I think that when we're talking about why we have the mask, it's, that, it's, it's armor, it's protection. And for me, you know, it is rap for you it might be saying something in a northern irish accent yeah, yeah. when you're being affectionate you know there's different ways of doing it we but it, have it probably masks. comes down to the same thing yeah 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 and um something we talked about actually off air as well and someone talked to you so your, your latest album that released in in 2020 happy hour mm. explores well lots lots of different things it explores one thing is is trying to get to grips with like what happiness is and and i think the happy hour itself there's that there's that lyric where it's like sadly so happy um so happy i could lie and i, I think well one two questions here one is what motivate motivated you to write that album mm -hmm. and two the other thing we were saying off air as well is you normally make music because you're so busy and you've got so many things you're doing mm. you normally make music write music when you have something to express mm. so what is it you were trying to express at at that time so to, to kind of understand Happy Hour, so Happy Hour is a, a, a sequel. Mm. And it's a sequel to an album that comes out the year before, which is called Excommunication. Excommunication, uh, in etymolog etymological terms of the, the name, it's where a Christian ceases to become a Christian, where you've done something mm. wrong. And because of the, you know, the crime that you have committed, you are removed from that sect. You are out of Christianity. So for me, Excommunication was when... Christian ceased to be a Christian. Now, this wasn't a religious sense, but my life kind of went so pear-shaped in such a rapid development that I lost all my sense of identity. And I, you know, I was having to recalibrate everything that I, I thought about myself and, and who I was. And the process for me was becoming a father unexpectedly. Mm. Uh, and it kind of really shunned me into... You know, my daughter's only four. She won't listen to this. And it's all good now. But, you know, it's, it shunned me into a terrible de depression. And, and my life became very, very turbulent. Mm. So much so that I was unable to even envision a future for me. I was excommunicated from who I thought I was. Uh, and so what had happened was, look, even in this is what I'm talking about, uh, I was right on the edge of living. I didn't want to live anymore. So I was kind of hospitalized. And when I decided I'd that suicide was an option for me or the, the one that I certainly wanted to take when I did my suicide note. I'm not writing it out. It's in a rap song, live on all digital platforms. So, I mean, that whole album was, is something that I made as kind of a goodbye or an explanation as, as to why I'd gone down this road. So it was, you know, a hugely hev heavy time. You know, mm. I was off work. I was, and like I say, I was not prepared for this. Mm. because this wasn't something that I could get a grade on or revise for. You know, this was real life, and it hit me in a way that I was completely unprepared to deal with. And I, again, wasn't telling people until it was too late. I was trying to fix the bridge after I'd already fallen in the Thames kind of thing. So it was too late. 
but then I, I, I survive it and, I, and then I, I start repairing my life and I, you know, begin to grow. And then so I'm looking at happiness through a, a, a different lens at this mm. point because I've, I've seen the absolute absence of happiness and I've experienced what true, true sadness is to, to the depths of still being alive and experiencing that. So that made me think, why is happiness so elusive? Why is it this thing that we chase, that we find so difficult to attain? And can we ever truly attain it? And so, I, you know, I talked to a lot of people, whether it was friends or even the children that I teach. I would, you know, I'd ask everyone I meet, what do you think of happiness? Mm. And I would take all these different, you know, answers that I got and distilled it into I was quite proud because it's exactly an hour to the second into, into this happy hour. Mm. And it, it's an hour's exploration of happiness. But yeah, the lyrics in there is, you know, I'm so happy, sadly so, so happy, I'm so happy, I'm so happy, I'm so happy I could die. When I perform that live, it's always weird because I do it with a smile on my face. It's quite catchy. It's got this kind of upbeat major chord trumpets that like sound like a fanfare. But what I'm talking about is suicide. And I remember one time I, I, I did that as, I don't know why I did that like during the performance. I noticed like all the crowd doing it as well, like like dancing along and just kind of like emulating death. Yeah. So it's all very weird. But again, it's all that kind of remove of, of taking the subject and putting it into something else. And I made this, you know, in parts quite happy album, quite meditative, thinking about it from from that sense whereas my first album was very you know very dark there was no hope in it this one was kind of more balanced i've been through enough of life and now the the reason there's no like third album is because i'm happy right mm. so mm. i i haven't felt the need to make a a, a third album a third installment I probably should just like, just like everything's all right now by the way <laughs> the yeah right like album, um, yeah. <laughs> like the everything's all right yeah yeah just every song like yeah i'm fine pretty good Yep, three meals a day. Yep. Uh, but that's not interesting. No one yeah. wants to listen to that. So, you know, we'll wait till my life goes pair again and then maybe we'll get a trilogy. <laughs> the but trilogy. Uh, yeah, so that was the genesis of the album. It was very much related. And just like we were saying when I was 14, that's why I made the album. It was to deal with what was going on in real life. Um, and it's How stuff- did that feel, though? But like the, the, on the first album, writing and recording a suicide note, essentially, if I'm understanding correctly, like. It was pretty fucked up. Yeah, like I, I'm trying to, I, I mean, I can't understand because I've never been through that. But what was that process like for you? And do you think doing that process helped you to get through that darker moment in your life? Or kind of? Well, wh- I, I think the album really helped because mm. it was like, it gave me a purpose. Like when you're not at work and you're kind of living in this this darkness, essentially, where where your future is completely shrouded in uncertainty. There was one thing that I'd had to hang on to. And it's like, right, I'm... I've got this concept of an album. It's going to be 16 songs and it's going to be really about everything that's happened. And that, you know, how, like a, how did we get to here point? But that means I've got to record 16 songs. Now that's going to take at least two days per song, you know? So that's at least 32 days time that I'm, I'm giving myself now. And then I've got to mix down the songs and then I've got to think about the arranging the sequence of the songs. Right. Okay. I'm going to need a couple months to do that. Then I want to make sure that people hear the album. So let, let's set up some stuff. So I'm going to need to be around for six months. So I, the album gives me something like a, a a deadline is like a pun, but yeah, it's like yeah. <laughs> a lifeline, a, a real deadline. Like yeah, yeah, an yeah. Actual, yeah. The, the deadline was a lifeline. Let's say that 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 would work. Um, so that's what kind of kept me, you know, focused. And you know, I I, I was in this hospital in, and they had these these gardens that you kind of walk around in, and it was. Uh, around springtime and uh, there was such vibrancy to like the flowers and the the birds and and the sky i wasn't able to access it but, but i was thinking oh, one day maybe you you could see the blue in the sky and you could hear that bird song again and so the album kind of got me to a point where i was more receptive mm. i like but at that time i was so kind of like when I was talking to the therapists and stuff that they, they put you with, I was so arrogant because obviously they know their stuff, right? They deal with suicide all the time. And I was like, oh, you don't need to talk about it. You know, is it like, <laughs> like in my mind, I was like, you couldn't possibly understand the pain that I have. Therefore, why would I listen to you? Because you just don't know, man. They do know. All right, yeah. so I want to apologize to, to Deborah. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so it's, but that's it. You just shrink so much in that world. But certainly excommunication was, I was obsessed with making it this body of work that, w- that was good, that was true that was honest. Um, and then, and then I actually wanted to be around for it, you know, because I was proud of it, you know? I mean, it was then awkward essentially mm. because I, I've, I've released a suicide note. Yeah. 
yeah, I've like put it on. Uh, like, and what did what did like friends or family? What did they? I mean, I'm just, when I, they listen I, I to it, know, what, what I, did you hear? Or did anyone ever speak to you about that? Uh, like someone close? One one of my friends did. Uh, like a review of, of the album. And for that song, he was just like, I, I don't want to talk about a song like a reviewer. So we're not just, we can't really discuss it because it's like some things are like too, too raw. Mm. Um, because I literally, I've just like picked out people in my life and said, you know, it started off with mates. It was like an open letter to my mates, like apologizing. Like why well, I'm always the one laughing in the pub. I'm always the first to say this, like the loudest one, but deep down this was going on and I just want to apologize for never talking, you know, then I, you know, I address my sister, my parents. So it's, it's a real, real kind of deep thing. Um, so I, I don't, I've never sat down and really had the, the conversations, mm. but yeah, there's just some songs out there that's just like, oh, I wasn't really thinking of the ramifications of still being alive when they were consumed. Uh, and then that was kind of like an awkward thing. Uh, so, but what was, was it awkward? Was it, was it ever embarrassing? Were you like, no, that's out there. Like, I'm glad it's out there. Have you ever, have you ever, I, yeah, has there any, ever been releasing something like that? Any, yeah, like embarrassment or regret of doing that or kind of your, as a, like a, you know, as something that was necessary for, you know, as you're saying, to stay alive, essentially. Like, are you proud of that being out there? Yeah, I mean, I definitely am proud of it as a body of work. But there are, you know, but be like almost like beyond that, I guess. Beyond that is, you know, if someone meets me through that, they're gonna think oh, this guy is terribly upset. At a lot <laughs> of stuff, yeah. you know, like this guy, this is a man on the edge. Mm. You might not check the date on the album. You might have just met me for whatever reason, yeah, and then be like, oh, I'll check out his music, listen to this, be like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> so it certainly was a. It captured who I was at that time. Mm. I liked. I'd like to think that. I'm more prepared to deal with life's ills now than I was. I mean, I felt young. I'm only 30 now, but I was, this isn't a long time ago. I was 26, 25, mm. 26 making this album. So it's not a long time ago. But even in those four years, I feel like the difference between that and the Happy Hour album was that I, you know, I was more measured on it. Even mm. like when I listen to it from a stylistic point of view, it's, it's slower, it's less kind of manic, it's more thoughtful. I think mm. so. So I have moved in that direction um, to the point that I'm so thoughtful now. I don't even say anything. No, no <laughs> like no more albums. But yeah, to, to answer your question, I, I am glad it's out there. And hashtag no regrets. Apart from yeah. couple. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag, hashtag no regrets, few regrets. Slash couple. <laughs> Um, and with Happy Hour, and like you're saying, when you are seeing the kids, like what does happiness mean? And I know you've got some sound clips of them in some of the mm. tunes as well. What did you learn from that? Like, it, you know, I guess it is the hundred million dollar question. What is happiness? Like, do you feel like you can answer that, or do you feel was there something that a kid said? You're like, okay, that feels like the answer. Well, I mean, I certainly feel it's it's in the eye of the beholder, you know. I mean, there was one child, he, he actually wrote a poem on sadness, but it told me a lot about emotion anyway. And he listed like all, all the sad things in his life. And it, 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 it was only five writing this, it was pretty deep. Um, and it begins with, he's talking about how his grandmother's died and then his grandfather's died. And then all the sadnesses are given equal weight. He says, you know, my grand's died, my granddad's died. Um, my sister bumped my knee with a toy and uh, I lost the skipping rope. Uh, they were all given e equal weight, and and what that's it was the immediacy of the because he'd lost the skipping rope and bumped his knee that day. Therefore, they were very present in his mind, uh, mm. and they were given equal weight of sadness to bereavement of loved ones. And so, with children, they experience emotions in a very heightened sense, in a very immediate sense, and. That's, you know, we might do that as adults and just not express that. When something happens immediately, it's at its most raw, you know. And certainly with me, those emotions of sadness were so raw in the moment that I never thought there was a moment beyond that. Mm. So what I learned from the children is that, you know, I'm able to see that you are sad in this moment, but tomorrow the skipping rope and the bump of the knee, you will not remember. So when I'm going through terrible emotions in the moment, I think of how I, you know, saw them and think... Someone is going to be looking at me like, you're not going to care about this as much as you do now, tomorrow, mm. the day after less. Ten years from now, you will not even think about it. So it's a, what I learned about happiness and sadness 
is they're all fleeting. What's the phrase? This too shall pass. Yeah, I don't know who who, shall, yeah. who it's attributed to, but it's it's right. Whether it's good, it'll not last forever. Whether it's bad, that won't last forever either. So that's very existential. Everything <laughs> everything's all right. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's true though. I think happiness, sadness. I think it it comes in waves in our lives, and I and I think something that I've definitely learned better to do over the last five or six years is actually to like be aware that it's all right to be especially more of the lower moments to be like okay this is a bit of a down moment now it's okay to feel like this for like mm. the next you know not to put a time period on this and be like i'm i will be okay feeling like this for two weeks yeah. but it's 14 okay days of sadness yeah then, 14 uh, days of sadness right days of mild yeah, discomfort okay. and Another, yeah 400 hours <laughs> left but but yeah I, th- I i think it's something that i think it's uh, a lot of us actually struggle to to learn how to deal with that and i think the the ups we can we can deal with because we're happy and we're up mm. and time flies in those situations like because when we're down is learning to sit with it and learning to sit with an emotion or a feeling and and like you're saying just knowing that it will pass but also knowing that it is okay to feel sad about something it is okay to feel anxious about something and i think i think it is a, i think it is an important skill that i think some people and a lot of people find hard to i've definitely in my life at times found it hard mm. um the one one other thing as well when talking about happiness i think c- contentness for mm. me is is such an important word when when talking about happiness and i think there's lots of other things as well that make it up and it's hard to define exactly what it is as you learn on on the journey of writing <laughs> yeah. the album but it's it's that contentness and the reason why i think it's important because whether you are happy or sad it's being content with how you you are feeling and knowing mm. that mm whether it's happy or sad, it will pass mm. knowing that you have this and you don't need any more. It's like that contentness for me, certainly when it comes to feeling anxious about something, that kind of like feeling of, no, it's okay. I'm content yeah, yeah. with this helps, helps me a lot. Mm. Um, I'm conscious on time and conscious that also that I could probably talk to you for another four hours. Although I know you've had a, a, <laughs> a, a, a stressful ending to the day. So hopefully this has been the, the calming down experience you needed. But just before we go, I, I just, I'm really interested if you could just share a little bit about the work that you do in, in prisons as well, please. So I haven't actually been in since COVID. Um, so it's been a little while since I've been in there. So I run poetry workshops, essentially. Uh, and so in a, in a prison like the Category B prison, um, you know, you're not going to have murderers. You're not going to have hugely hardened criminals. But what I find is that um, when just I... Just the guys that punch little kids in the face. Yeah, yeah, a bit of that, you know, a bit of that. <laughs> I recognized him. <laughs> you know, I'm helping people who are in prison to talk about their circumstance and and express it. It can be a very difficult thing, though, and I have to be very, very careful about what poems I share. And we have to vet them. Mm. Right? We'd have to vet them very carefully. Like if I did a poem, if I was wor- working with a certain wing and I did a poem about my granddad. Now, that doesn't seem like a bad thing to do. I want to share, you know, this, this my granddad's a fisherman. I want to talk about going fishing with my granddad. But then someone, one of my colleagues would say, Christian, you can't do a poem about granddads. A lot of these are grandparents, you know, and their relationship with their grandchildren might not be, you know, mm. something that it should be explored through poetry. So there's, there's all of these minefields. So I'm there to help people to express, but sometimes the nature of crimes still seeps through into the poetry. So it can be a very difficult area to work in, but it's, you know, it's incredibly rewarding and people will sign up to do poetry they really you know you got they want to be out their cell yes but they really want to come in and just have that chance to write some of my groups they're not very literate you know they've never been taught to read or write so part of the part of the the challenge is to bring that literacy in you know so mm. we might sit down and, and we would scribe for for the inmates and so their story could be told i think that prisons are a colorless world they're very gray they're very monotonous they're very mm. routine and that's real the real punishment is that's how it weighs down on you that kind of drudgery of existence and i think that that is an incredibly oppressive place to be so i you know i theme my poetry that i work with them on as escapism Never on escape because physical escape is very different to escapism. You know, yes. prison wouldn't pay me to come in and run escape yeah. sessions like prison break. Escape planning, yeah. Yeah, but it's certainly that, you know, escapism is a mental diversion from an unpleasant reality. And it's like the idea of having poetry in prison to any other poet who does it, because a lot of poets do it. And we go in and it's, you've got this one hour and through this pen, you can be anywhere you like. 
just mm. like when I was four years old and I wanted to tell those fictional mad stories for mm. these guys and these women who are in the prisons because we're at the women's wing as well, which is a whole other thing. Like the first time I walked in there, they just kept chanting, how big is your dick to me? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> what an entrance to, to a session. Yeah, it's a real interesting realm of work. And when people say, oh, prison is fine, you know, they're, they're all treated really well. It's, it's not, it's, you don't want to end up in prison. They're horrible places. They're not mm. very well maintained. And everyone who works in them is a difficult environment. Certainly you go in and you feel the air tighten, mm. you know, and you feel everything shrink around you. And, you know, it's unsettling. So it's not this walk in the park that people, you know, often on the right wing say, oh, we treat our prisoners yeah. too well. It's, it's buttoned into them. It's like, yeah. it, is, it is not. It's a hard environment. Like mm. the, the program, the BBC program, Time, was the most accurate representation of a prison that I've seen on, on screen with Sean Bean and Stephen Yeah, Graham. I watched the first episode. Oh, yeah, I need it, to, yeah. it was heavy and it was real. That kind of grey environment with a sense of threat all the time. Mm. I think that's how a lot of people feel in it you know mm. and i don't do too much work in prisons i'm dipping in i'm dipping out but enough to have a little bit of experience of what that must be like like in mm. the prison that i was in i saw someone that i'd gone to school with well they'd gone to the school across the road um a few years older and he just said to me he's like i can't take it any more i can't be in here for another day longer i just can't and this is someone you know similar age to me and he's mm. still got another four years <sighs> so so when you're when you're feeling yeah. like that you know, and this guy wasn't, he wasn't writing a poem. He just wanted to be out of his cell, you know, and he was telling me how he felt. He didn't really want to write. And he's just that, that sense of claustrophobia. And you mm. think that must be a tough, tough existence. So I think that's why there needs to be more focus on arts in prisons. Mm. The punishment is already there. Why are we trying to punish people who are already Even, being yeah. punished by being in prison? We have to have a focus on rehabilitation like the Scandinavian countries do. You mm. know, they they purely focus on rehabilitation and they have... Which is what you need to yeah, do. They have less reoffenders naturally because they have rehabilitated successfully. Here, we devote almost no time to it. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit of here and there. You might get a bit of creative writing. You might yeah. get... And we, we overlook like a, a lot of people in prison they've had awful childhoods as well of course you know and like we like, we as a society overlook that or like we don't care about that so many people in society don't yeah. care about that being in prison is not the beginning of a road it is the kind of the end of it's a road the, yeah, that the you've end been of traveling a, yeah. for a long time where there's been various different chances to get help you might not have received it you know mm. it's certainly not the start of a journey it's been a long journey to get to the point where you're in prison yeah. you know and no one is born no one is born evil no one is born in a way that they're gonna commit a crime mm. it is a reactionary thing you know it's enough Stuff, happens yeah. that you react to it and eventually you know you're gonna go down that road because of different circumstances i'm not saying that individuals don't have agency and can't make their own choices yes for sure and i'm not saying that everyone in you know prison is someone i'd like to go on holiday with because there's some some mean people i've met you know yeah but but yeah. by and large you know everyone is a human and there is there is rehabilitation available to everyone on this planet i don't care what you've done or who you are you know it's that old, like darth vader right yeah yeah what's that thing of we always look at the destination rather than like the journey people have eat even in a business sense we look at oh someone has started this company and sold it for x amount mm -hmm. but what is the journey they've been on yeah. so i think in every area of life we ignore like what's happened before a lot of the time and we just focus on like where they've got to whether that mm. be prison whether that be achievements i think it's it's something we tend to ignore the the hard work mm. you know um thank you very much right, we've run out of time but i feel like we could speak for another hour it's been amazing having you on um do you just want to share with viewers listeners where they can hear more of your raps find the music listen to the albums just google me no i'm joking right <laughs> so you've got a if you want to find my music best place probably spotify so christian foley just type that in that will come up with happy hour excommunication you want to listen to that uh, you can get me on twitter c foley poetry you can get me on instagram christian foley poetry you see the trend you get me on tiktok if you're 12 uh and you can get, yeah, that's Christian Foley poetry as well. That's where I have my most followers. TikTok yeah. it annoys me, man. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that's where to find me. My website, christianfoley.co.uk. You can email me and then I might email back. Cool. Well, thanks so much for, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Love You're the welcome. conversation. I don't know if there is anything else you want to like leave the viewers with. 
I think that we've said what we needed to say. Okay, <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, well, thanks again. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks for watching. Remember, if you are watching on YouTube, remember to subscribe. Um, and on any podcast platform that you're listening to, remember to give it a subscribe. Uh, I think there's no Yogi's admin news, so we'll leave it there. Thanks, everyone. And for now, take it geezy. Oh.